we'll, we'll get back on that, yeah. Um, um, let's see what time it is, okay. I'll give one more minute and then we'll, we'll start. Um, you guys are set up for this discussion today. Yeah, so uh, based on the uh, materials that you have shared with us, so we covered two of them last week, uh -huh. and the last one we covered this week. Perfect, perfect. So that's great. Yeah, that's great. for the next week, I'm if you really want to know what's going on. Oh, okay. Yeah. We could cut up too. We can yeah. cut the yeah, yeah. the noise a little bit. But right now you're set for today, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's great. That's great. Y you managed to just go through those materials, right? Not to not to do anything else. Uh, no. Yeah, I mean, just but just uh, after class we had uh, some questions. Some questions. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So we, uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds good. Sounds good to me. Yeah. So are we ready to start? Yeah. Um, can you all hear me well on the back? Um, great. So, so welcome again to the CSC two for two machine learning. So, um, a few quick updates. Um, so, so basically, the, the quizzes seem to be quite popular in the last few sessions. So we we're deciding to to keep them. This is the first. This is the first time we, we're doing these quizzes. These quizzes were not done like last last year when the the course was taught. So. Um, so we're sort of like right now it's the first time but, but it, it seems like we're gonna keep on doing them i think i think it's gonna be quite good to to be uh, make it a bit more interactive and sort of discuss some of these questions afterwards um we, we will use some of this for uh, the class attendance so for example i, I said at the beginning that there's like around 10 percent of the final mark for attendance so, so we'll use some of the quizzes for example towards that so um but it's not do not be worried about it in the sense like uh, we won't count it mostly will be like attendance not sort of like your performance in the actual quiz so um but uh yes so don't worry about that um and uh yeah uh, so so if you remember so last time we went through so just a bit of recap so we went through we finished linear algebra and we went through principal component analysis and we we showed how um we can basically uh project our data onto a few principal components that basically uh, reduce our dimensionality. So then we can make it much easier to, to train and, and for example, to, to, to feed that to a, to a machine learning model afterwards and, and, and do some predictions. Do, do you guys have any questions on, on uh, principal component analysis and like what we did last time? Okay, um, so, let's, so let's move on then. So today we'll do, we'll start with linear regression and uh, and we'll introduce a more broadly the idea of a loss function, and then we come back to the bias variance trade off. So let's let let's let's get through them. Um, let me start my timer so I keep track of time. Um, hmm. This was working just now. Okay. So um, so 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 just a. a a bit of yeah uh, a bit of like overview of linear regression so essentially in so far we've been discussing classification tasks where we basically have 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 to predict a few discrete classes so again we're talking about a labor space that is discrete we're talking about like categories is this a blue box in the image or a red box is a cat or a dog in the image is a and so on so um these are all kinds of like um use classification we can do scoring with these discrete problems like ranking and so on we can order um but regression, what regression does is that it, 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 we, we learn a continuous mapping. So we learn the outputs are continuous, they're not discrete anymore. So more, more precisely, we learn a function that is a regressor that is mapping, mapping our input domain X to 
a continuous number in R, any, any real number, for example. We want to predict, for example, the price of a house. So that, that the price of the house is a continuous number. It's not, it's not a, a discrete class anymore. So that's, that's when we, we're in a regression setting. So in this case, we use a like, regression type of methods uh, to learn that. And to learn them from examples of inputs and outputs. So x is x size and f of x size, which are the outputs, for example. So, so houses and their prices and so on. And we learn from that how to predict the price of a house. Um, so, so again, the, the target variable here is real valued. This, the output is in R. It's, it's any real number. Um, and, and again, we, we will... Um, we, will meet, uh, we will be using examples that are noisy. So, so, uh, so these examples from the training data will have noise to them. We will, they won't be, for example, like the, the house prices might not, might not be exactly the right price of the house. There might be a lot of noise in the, uh, in the, in the training data. So, so we have to still watch out for overfitting. What we were discussing, like actually in the first session about overfitting and underfitting. So, um, uh, but the idea is that we want to capture the general trend, not, not, not actually like fit any individual data points so um we don't want to match them exactly perfectly we want to get the, the idea of a trend because there will be noise and if we, we we if we predict everything perfectly we will likely overfit so so this is a, a, an example of a regression setting so for example your training data here has an axis which is single dimensional so these could be inputs of one 2.5 for example these could be all kinds of things and, and f of x is basically the output of that so 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 this this is um uh again a, a real valued number so these could be all kinds of again like another example that i can think of so this is classical uh, a classical problem in economics is to predict uh your income from years of education for example so so given a, a, a economists have been studying that for a while or given a, an amount of years of education what will be your expected future income for example into the future so so here like you know x's could be years of education y can be f of x could be future income for example for people, so all, all kinds of things. This is a, yeah, um, and I, this is an example from economics, but uh, all kinds of things. So, um, so here, uh, look uh, for example how this the the orange lines are basically a piecewise linear fit. So, so basically, we, we, we for each region, for each boundary here in the, in the, the, the data set, we, we we fit a constant linear function, and we fit the data perfectly. So you see, ev every point is captured by the by the model by the model prediction. Whereas, for example, this is a global linear fit, so this one does not go through all the points. It captures the general trend. So, so we, we can see how uh, it's quite obvious how why we would prefer the global linear fit, for example, because it sort of captures the general trend as opposed to individual data points that, that would have noise, for example. They, they would, these ones would be noisy. So, um, so what, how do we define formally linear regression? So given a set of data points so xi and y so x's are input features and y's are the labels and and and, and we have m data points from one to m and, and one up to m so basically we have m total data points we need to find um a set of parameters theta such that so now here i have x as a matrix here so we, I, I take all the data points uh, and all the features so this x is two-dimensional uh data points by features times uh, <coughs> vector theta. This is a vertical vector. So this is um, a matrix by a vector multiplication. Minus y minus vector y has to be approximately zero. So th th this is like a, an equation of a for linear regression uh, in, uh, in terms of matrices here. So, so x, again, x is a matrix. Uh, theta is a column vector. Y, y is also a vector. So here, uh, this is an example of um, when, the data point, when the data has only two features. So for example, we have three data points, three examples uh, with two features each, and, and Y is the label that we want to predict. So five, seven, and nine. Uh, this will be a data matrix, X. This will be the label, and, uh, uh, which is a, yeah, a vertical vector. So again, and, and theta would be again a vector just like Y. Okay, so, uh, so how do we, the question, how do we learn this model? How do we learn it? Any ideas? L let's hear a bit, some ideas from, from from everyone. How do we learn theta? So, so here uh, we, we have to find the parameters of theta. Yeah. 
yeah. We'll randomly initialize theta, right? And then we'll use the input given uh, the two three examples, and then we'll calculate the error using log function, and then optimize it accordingly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so we randomly initialize theta, and then we define a loss function, and we optimize the loss function accordingly. That's 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 really really a really good idea. Um, that, 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 does that make sense? We we define so so we we define a loss function here with respect to this equation, and and we minimize optimize the loss function, and that's how we find and the loss function will be because of theta, and that's how we find theta. Uh, is there a simpler solution to that uh, than that? For example, yes, some in the back. Why do you need system of Say again. Why do you need system of yeah, yeah. How 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 does that work? So exactly. So, so Im imagine if this is one dimensional, if these are not matrices, imagine if this is, a, this is a scalar. So x times theta minus y equals to zero. These are all scalars. So we just have the linear system of linear equations. So, so theta would be y divided by x. So if, if, these, would be, if these would be scalars. But uh, the, the only trick is that these are now matrices and vectors. And we have to be a bit more, uh, it, it's almost the same intuition, almost the same, almost the same, but we have to be a bit more careful with how, yeah, we do these inversions. Inverse. The inverse, yes, yeah, so, so inverse of the matrix. Um, how, how, how would that be? So um, x times theta equals y, we... Uh, Yeah, 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 that's, uh, yeah. So, so, so we're, we're, we're coming, we're coming to that. So, this is the inverse. That's, you, you're a bit ahead. Yeah. So, so if if we multiply by x minus one, pre-multiply by x minus one, if if x is invertible, for example, if you assume x is invertible, then we pre-multiply by x minus one. So, x minus one times x times theta equals x minus one times y. So, we pre-multiply both sides of the equation. We have x theta equals y. We pre-multiply by x minus one. So, so the left-hand side cancels out, and we'll, ideally, we get theta equals x minus one y. Um, now, um, now this is uh, again, uh, this is only the case if x is invertible. So sometimes x might not be invertible. Actually, here, because um, x is not even a square matrix, it's it's, it's a rectangular matrix. It's three by two. That doesn't have an inverse, uh, as as classically defined. Uh, so there's no x minus one for it. So. Uh, um, yeah, um, so what, we, we, so I get back to that and what we'll do, we, we'll, we'll turn it into a square matrix. We'll see shortly what to do inverse. So, uh, we have some really good idea. Let, let, let's get back to them in, in a couple minutes. So, um, so one way we can do it. So, so we can again remark, we, we've been saying that X theta minus Y equals zero. Uh, so what we can do, one thing we can do, um, what, what our colleague was saying in the front that we can uh, design a loss function. We can turn it into an L2 norm here so this is equ equivalent to uh, x uh, x theta minus y for each data point summed together but then we raise to the power of two and make this equal to zero because um, these when we raise to the power of two these all have to be equal to zero each 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 of these uh, differences here all of them uh, f f such that the, the whole thing uh, would be zero does it make sense and then this 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 comes this is equivalent so th this why this this is equivalent to this because all the, all the rows will have to be equal to zero. Uh, and same over here. So, so we can do that, and then we can cast the least squares algorithm as, yeah, in terms of a, in terms of a loss function, as, as our colleague was saying. So we define a loss function, j of theta, which is, and now we're using this form instead, so we, which is the sum over all the data points. So here we had just three data points from a previous slide. But th th this this is generalizable. So, of of x uh, x x i transpose. So, so x i is the i to data point in x um, times theta, and this this is vector product. This is inner product between uh, a row vector x transpose and, and a column vector theta. Uh, so this result will be a scalar minus y uh, the label of the i to data point squared. So so we we converted it into a loss function, and then we can now we can optimize it. For example, with um, how do you optimize a loss or well, like a function generally, like in mathematics? I want to hear the key the keywords. 
the derivative equals zero. First order condition, yes. We set the derivative to be zero. We always apply the first order uh, necessary and sufficient conditions. So, um, so we take the function and we set a deri uh, compute a derivative of j with respect to theta, and we have to set that to zero. And that's how we, we find the, uh, the, the critical points of the function. Um, of course, to, to, actually, to actually do a minim to ensure we're minimizing, we have to also ensure that, uh, that the function is concave, more precisely. But so we have to compute the second derivative. But that we, 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 uh, right now, we're just doing the first derivative. Um, so, so, so this is a matrix form. Again, x, x theta minus y. So, so this is, uh, this is what, what gives us. So basically, we, have, we get rows with each, each of these uh, elements. Um, and we can also write it like this. So, so this, this form, we uh, to the power of two. We can also write it as so. So, which also also this this whole loss function. We can also write it as, um, in terms of matrices, so x theta minus y transpose times x theta minus y. Because if you do the uh, these, um, um, this would be uh, again a, a row vector. This would be another column vector on the right. And when we multiply, we get everything to the power of two. Yeah, question. Uh, thank you so much for telling me that. So um, I'll stay more here in that case, yeah. Can, can you hear now well on Zoom? Thank you for that, yeah. Uh, so so do, do check on Zoom, if, and if you have any questions, if you have any questions on Zoom, do write them in the chat, and my TAs will, will take them and, and will ask. Um, great. Um, yes, it's better now, sure. Okay, so, um, so I stay here, so perfect. The, the, uh, does it all make sense f so far, what, what, what we've done? We, we've basically taken the linear problem and turned it into a loss function. And now we're computing the first the, the first derivative of it. Okay, so so the, the the final solution that we actually get is is what is also termed into, uh, what is called the pseudo inverse of the matrix. So so this is this is basically the, the the formula for the pseudo inverse x transpose x minus one x transpose y. And 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 why why we get a solution? Well, we simply take this previous loss function j, and we, com we compute the derivative and set it to zero. That's what we've been talking about. So first, uh, we compute the derivative, set it to zero, and we solve, the, uh, solve this, and, and this will give us this solution. And I'll leave that to you as an exercise to do at home, but uh, th this is one way you can do it. And, and another way you can think about it, I guess to give some algebraic intuition, is that um, how you get this, this solution is by, um, by starting from this equation, x theta minus y so so basically i don't know if i if i should do this with the let, let's see uh, can x theta equals one. can you all see if i write here you can all see it briefly so so basically we have this equation and and again if if we had um I'm trying to see. I, I don't know if people on Zoom would see, but but it, 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 this will be short. So, so we have x times theta equals y. Um, ideally, x would be invertible, like uh, there would be an x minus one, for example, here. So if we, if we had an x minus one, ideally we can just pre-multiply by by x minus one, and then we get x minus one times x, which cancel out. So then uh, times theta is equal to x minus one times y. So that would be theta equals x minus one times uh, times y, but uh, but but uh, often it doesn't have an inverse. That's the problem. So then what we do, we turn this, uh, and this is also like a matrix that is not rectangular. So we make it into a square matrix. So we multiply by, we pre-multiply by x transpose. So so we do this. So so then we what we get is that um, x transpose times x times theta equals x, x transpose y, and now we can multiply by the inverse of this x transpose x to the power of minus one and if we pre-multiply by that this will cancel out so then we would get x transpose x minus one x transpose x theta equals x transpose x 
minus 1, x transpose y. So you see, so these cancel out, and now we get theta equals x transpose x minus 1, x transpose y. Does it make sense? So we, we, we pre-multiply by these matrices, and we can get uh, Yeah, so and, and then and then it cancels out and what we get is that uh, theta equals to to that to the pseudo inverse which is this formula on the on the on the board so this is more of an algebraic intuition of uh, of this any questions on this okay have you seen this before is it okay some how many of you have seen this a few okay not too many around four okay um Okay, so so um, so let's uh, let's. Uh, so one thing I wanted to hi highlight is that this is an analytical solution, and in practice we will not have for for nonlinear models we will not have an analytical solution because uh, at, yeah I mean it would be very nice to to do it in one go but in practice like we will not have these solutions and we'll have to actually do numeric optimizations we'll have to define these loss functions like this. And, and numerically optimize them with algorithms. Um, and, and, and that's how we're going to, yeah, uh, we're going to solve most of our nonlinear uh, models. Um, and, and, and I'm coming now, so I wanted to come back, if you don't have any more questions, uh, but do ask me otherwise. I wanted to come back and revisit a bit the ba uh, bias variance trade off, because this, um, it's a good time because now we introduce a bit the idea of a loss function and, and how, how we work with that. And, um, and let's see how, uh, how, we can study a bit the bias variance trade for a linear model, like like what we what we discussed now. So, so suppose that we have these this model where the, our labels y were generated from from x's from input x's, which were passed by uh, through a function f, and and then we also add a noise to it. So here f f here is the true function, the true model. This is not the model we going to learn. This is the true model that is sort of unknown, let's say, but we're, we're assuming this is how data was generated. So F is a true model. And we're now interested in a model G. So, so now we're training a different model G to do, to, um, by minimizing this uh, prediction error. So, so, so we take expected value uh, over the noise of G of X minus Y squared. So this is like of the, of these, like this, uh, this is an L2 loss um, in terms of the prediction labels. And, uh, and we take an expected value of that. So, so now we'll, l let's study a bit this, um, this term here. So, so the expected value of, of g of x minus y squared is equal to, 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 to the same thing, but now we, we subtract an f of x and add an f of x. So, so far here we haven't done much. We just subtracted and added two, uh, two numbers. Um, and and, and remember that uh, y is equal to f of x plus epsilon by definition of how we defined it in the previous slide. So f of x minus y, so this term here, f of x minus y is equal to minus epsilon from this. So we can rewrite this as g of x minus f of x min uh, minus epsilon and everything squared. So, so far we all we've done, we just like we, we uh, added and subtracted some, uh, some functions and we, we use this definition. Um, and now if we expand the square, so we, we expand this, so we get that this term is equal to g of x minus f of x squared plus epsilon squared minus 2 epsilon times g of x minus f of x. So, so we expanded the, the square. Um, and, and because now, um, because these random variables are independent, what we can do the the, the, the sum of uh, the sum of expectations is equal. To, uh, no, the expe expected value of a plus b is equal to expected value of a plus expected value of b. So we apply this, and we can break apart this these sums. So now we have the expected value of this whole thing is the expected value of over the first term plus the noise expected value of the noise minus two times expected value of over that. So th this is. Um, we apply this rule, um, and and what we do now is that uh, and uh, sorry now now because expected now because these random variables are independent now we can basically say that the expected value over 
a times b, so this is epsilon times g of x minus f of x, is equal to the expected value over, over e of a, uh, over the noise times the expected value over uh, g of x minus f of x. So, so, so if you see, we're kind of breaking this apart. We're breaking this thing apart. And, um, and this, um, so first of all, the, the expected value over the noise now, this will be zero. So the expected value, of, because the noise was sampled from zero, one, from uh, Gaussian was zero, one. So, all, uh, so this cancels out on the right. And what we get is just the expected value over g of x minus f of x squared plus the expected value over the noise, noise squared. Um, so this is um, the expected squared error to f. So here, this, this is the expected uh, error of the model versus the true model, plus the variance due to noise. Um, so, so it's also the variance of g of x plus the bias of g of x squared. So let, let, let's 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 see how how we get these. How how we actually like uh, how we get these. So um, the expected value. So so if we take this last term, the expected value of g of x minus f of x squared. This is equal. To, so so now. Um, Um, we basically um, um, subtract a g, a g bar and add the g bar, and basically what what this gives us is that we can we can group this together. So so, and actually I think this this two should be inside. Should be there should be another bracket and do this to the power of two. Um, just to clarify, because we, we we have to expand that uh, that whole formula. So we're still in, within the expectation. So this power actually there's a typo here. This two should be inside the square bracket, um, but th this is basically now. Now we're expanding the square, and we get g of x minus g bar. So g bar again is the mean of g of x squared plus g bar minus f of x squared plus two times g bar minus uh, g of x minus g bar g bar minus f of x. So if you look closely at this, so th this is actually the variance of the model g. This is the, the expected value of x minus e of x, for example. So this is, this is a formula of the variance. So this is expected the variance of the model, g. And the right-hand side here is, is the bias of the model. So here, because, because this, is, this, is our, this is the mean uh, prediction of our model. This is, this, this is g as our prediction model. This is the mean prediction. And f is the true model. This is the, the bias, how, how far away it was from the actual true model. And 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 you find that this term again uh, cancels out, so this this becomes zero also. So so we all, all what we get is the variance of the model g plus the bias of the model. So so one, one, so one thing the reason why I'm trying to highlight is because now we get exactly the decomposition into the bias and the variance what we we're talking about in the first slide for this particular linear model, and it's really it's really um, it's really nice to get it like this, um, and. Remember that this is all. This is basically our loss function that we want to optimize. We want to optimize initially. So, so, so of course we're trying to minimize the prediction error as much as possible. And we get that, it, that it's, it's 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 basically it has two components: it has the variance component, the, the variance and the bias. So, so of course uh, we can have models that have uh, this particular th that are more biased but have lower variance and vice versa and flipped around. So. Um, can have models that can have uh, this term uh, significantly higher than this one, but uh, again, the error is a trade-off between these two these two components. Any questions here? G is our model. G is our model. Yes. Y, y minus uh, the expected value over, so the, the variance is, um, the variance of x is the expected value over x minus e of x uh, and, and squared. So this is like this. So the expected value over x minus e of x. If, um, I'll have to rewrite it. I don't think you guys, everyone can see. Um, it's so var. Uh, 
special value over x minus e of x. So that's the variance uh, of a random, yeah, that, that, that we, that we re uh, revised last week. So you can, if you see here, this is, this is your mean. This is the mean of, uh, of, of the model. This, this will be equivalent to this e of x. And, and the first one is g of x is still our random variable. It's basically our random variable. It's like the predictions, uh, the output basically. It's like, the, yeah, a random variable over the output. Any other question? So this is just for me the, the other error function is like the last one you said, the last one you said. This is our last function, yes. So we need basically the numerator of the last. So this previous one to minimize the entire problem. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Where does the trade off come? Like we can minimize so, so, sometimes it will be hard to achieve both. To, to it will be hard to get both of these exactly to zero. So some models will have uh, this one higher, and some, and some models will have this one higher. And Th th this is a way, but we, we're trying to minimize both, but in practice, yes, that's, um, that's where the trade-off comes. But in practice, um, many models will not be able to make these both zero, exactly zero. We'll have to give something, kind of. L let me, um, I thought I had, yeah, I'll, I'll, ha I'll show you some examples. Um, Yeah, so I'll show you some examples very shortly. I wanted to go through one more slide and then I'll show you some pictures and I think it made more sense with like the bias variance trade off. Do, do we have any other questions on this? So yeah. The, the last term? Yeah, this, the, uh, this one? This one here. Um, because. Um, so, so this is the, uh, so, so I can expand. So basically, we remember we have an expected value here at the beginning, which takes everything over everything, including the last term. So we'll get that the, uh, we move this expected value over there. So then we'll get two times the expected value of g of x minus g bar uh, times g bar minus f of x. Um, and, and these, um, so first of all, this, um, um, the, the expected value of a, g of a g of x minus g bar is equal to g bar minus g, which is equal to zero, because essentially the uh, expected value over g of x is g bar. This is how the g bar was defined. So you get basically they, they cancel out, so they get uh, zero and, and, the, and the other term. So this term will become zero and, and it will cancel out this other term basically. Yeah. G bar is defined as expected value as the uh, E of G of X. Any other question? Yeah. Okay, um, so uh, one thing we still need to add to, to generally get some more control over these linear models and, opt and, and solutions is is, uh, is often what is called the regularization coefficient. It's, it's basically, th this is something that enables us to control the complexity of the model. And, and or, or even to say the complexity of the solution as well. We can also say that. Um, so so this, uh, this is what uh, is called regularized least squares. And, um, and generally regularized least squares penalizes the complexity of the model and reduces the variance but does increase the bias. So the more regularization you add, the more biased you, you add. So, so remember, this is the bias. So, so we add more, this term will become bigger and this one will become smaller as we add regularization. So, so it, add, it gives us more control over these terms. So, so how, how we do it. So first of all, uh, th 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 these are the slides from the Bishop book. So, so uh, this is the, our textbook for the course, the textbook Bishop book. And, and they used to just want to say they use a different notation there, but it's, it's, it's basically the same. They use t instead of y and, and phi of x instead of x. And, and because essentially they, they, they basically say these are pre-processed features, but you, you just think of them as x's for now. Like just whenever you see phi of x, just think, uh, just think of x. And, and they use w instead of theta, for example. So, 
Um, so they have the same thing. They have the, the sum over all the data points of, of, of the labels Y. Of our, the, the, so these are, for example, like the, the house prices you want to predict. Minus, uh, these are the inputs, X are the inputs, minus W uh, 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 transpose times phi of X. So basically this is, again, uh, W is our, our theta, our parameters. And now what, what we add, we add this term, uh, which, which, which is basically a, a W transpose times W, it's basically an L2 loss. Oh, well, one second, let me finish this. Um, and uh, it adds, sorry, it adds an L2, uh, uh, L2 norm. It's basically, it's basically penalizing the, um, the solution W to be not too far from the origin. Because basically, uh, when, uh, this will be zero when only when W is at the origin. So uh, the further away you are from origin, the, yeah, uh, the more penalized you are. So, um, and this la lambda again is, is it's the weight, the regression coefficient, and we'll see it's also like a Lagrange multiplier will come later on as a Lagrange multiplier. But uh, right now it's the, it's the weight of how much you penalize. So l I'll take questions now. Yeah, I'm yeah. Oh, you're trying to, to stretch. Oh, right. Uh, somebody else. Okay. Um, all right, uh, so so um, so it's the same setup setup we had from before, but now we just add these um, this penalty term. It's, it's it's simply that, and and this penalty penalizes the complexity of of the solution of W. And now um, we'll find that W again is minimized. Again, we do the same thing as before. We define a loss function. We set a derivative to be zero, and that's how we find the solution. Like in the yeah, we follow the system of equations, and we find that W is equal to we'll get this close from solution, which which is the same as the to the inverse, but now we add a lambda i. So basically, we scale this matrix with uh, we, we add this like identity matrix, and this essentially fundamentally even for matrices, this makes the, the this particular matrix better to be inverted. It makes it more regular, basically, to uh, more well behaved. So when we do the inverse, it's going to look much nicer also. Um, and, but, and for the solution, it makes the solution, um, yeah, um, well, sort of closer to, or to the origin in some sense. Where, and this is the case for L2 norm. But, um, so some people also, also view this, I want to say, as a prior over W. So this is more the Bayesian view of, uh, of, of, uh, of model fitting. And uh, so, ba so basically, this, 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 we see this is a all special case of a particular sort of like Bayesian setting. So, so ba Bayesian generally like, kind of like uh, approaches would, would generalize this to uh, all kinds of distributions that are yeah, uh, not just this particular uh, form. Um, so of course, th this, th the example before was with an L2 norm. The, what we had here is, we see th this is the W transpose times W, this is the L2 norm of W. This is the same thing, um, if you do the math. And, um, but in practice, we can use any any Q norm. We remember we went to, uh, to the Q norm last week. So 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 for example, um, and th this is how it will look like with a Q norm. So uh, th these are. Uh, are you familiar with these plots? Any of you are familiar with these uh, with the, with the norm circles? So so we actually, if you remember, we la last week we we drew the L one L one. Uh, for example, like a unit, this is called the unit circle, basically. But uh, but this is not this is it's a circle for the quadratic norm. But but for in general for other norms, it's not necessarily a circle. Actually, for example, this is for in for the, in the L one norm, the unit circle is a is a diamond. So so these are all the vectors that are of equal norm, are, are all of equal norm equal to, uh, to, uh, with one as well. So basically, all, all of all of these have norm equals one for different Q values. So that means this point here has a value, uh, has a norm, uh, has a q, uh, q norm of one. This one has a q norm of one, and this one has a q norm of one. So they are all uh, the same distance away from 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 the origin in this in this particular space in this particular norm. Um, so notice how we can increase the q more and more. This literally becomes almost like a square uh, as q will go towards infinity. This will become exactly a square. And, and as a Q uh, tends to zero, this becomes more closer and closer to two, like this. It kind of like gets very close to origin. Um, and this is, uh, uh, som somebody was asking me about sparsity, how, how these norms relate to sparsity. So you see, for example, if, if we go in a less and less Q here, um, 
the solutions basically we will only have a, a norm of one almost when only when these values are are, are basically are basically zero on some side like for example this is y equals zero this is x equals zero and so on so th th this is where the sparsity comes from from the fact that um, generally we only kind of accept solutions that uh, that align with uh, with x equals zero or y equals zero so so yeah um, so so uh, so uh, so how does this like um, bias variance trade off so again um, this is about regularization but let's see how what happens if we um, if we change this regularization coefficient like if we change this lambda that we've been talking about what what if we uh, we change it so so this is an example from the you know, from the bishop book we saw this example last time this is the true data the in green is the is the actual is the actual function that was used to to generate the data and, and and we have some data points here um well they're not on but it, it basically imagine like th 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 there were some some kind of data points uh, around here that we used to that, that were generated and then we fit we fit basically a particular model sorry so so, so that and, and you see if we have a lambda that is 2.6 that is maybe a bit too high we, we basically do not learn a, a model that is good enough. It does not approximate the true model that, that was used to generate the data. Um, if we decrease, so you see if you now, if we decrease the lambda, and this is, by the way, this is in log uh, space. This is log lambda, but it's, it's basically the same log. Uh, log is a monotonic function. So, so if we decrease the lambda now, so we make much less regularization. Now the model has less bias. So you notice now how how the line gets much closer to the true line, to, to the green one. But you see how the variance increase in the solutions. These are all possible models that are being sampled from, uh, from the distribution, from the Poisson distribution. These are, these are called Gaussian processes, but we're not covering them uh, right now in the course. We, I, I don't think we have time to, to go through these, but we see the variance is much, much higher here than compared to here. You see uh, this model has more bias f from the true uh, from the true line, but uh, but a low variance, whereas this one has has less bias, gets closer, but much more higher variance. And if we when if we set the, the, the regularization even lower, so we don't regularize almost at all, almost zero regularization, then you see how we have almost almost exact, almost almost no bias at all, but it's very high variance in in the solutions. They fluctuate a lot. Does it make sense? Yeah, okay. Um, so, let me go briefly to see the routing. Yeah, so, um, so this, this is a plot of, again, of the bias and variance trade-off that, uh, that you can use to visualize really well. So. So this, the blue, the black line is the test error of the model over that goes over the, over, over the X axis. So here, this X axis is the, is the, is LN of Lambda. This is the regularization coefficient. It's how much we regularize the model. So, um, so, so on the left here, we have really low regularization. Whereas on the right, we have very high regularization. So, so left also means, uh, there's, there's very low bias to no bias but but high variance you see so bl blue line shows bias so so it starts from really low bias and the bias increases over time over uh, as we increase the regularization but the variance decreases and notice how how we then find uh, we, we get then gain a sweet spot basically in a yeah the the bias squared plus variance which would be our error becomes a convex function that has a minimum around here so 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 that's, that's just a, the, this the, this might be an optimal value for for setting the regularization. You see the trade-off from, yeah. Um, any questions about, about this? Okay. Um, so, um, 
So now uh, uh, the next thing I wanted to introduce uh, briefly, and then we'll take a short break uh, soon um, in five or 10 minutes, is I wanted to start introducing the, the concept of logistic regression. So, so logistic regression, what we have is that instead of doing um, now actually like a, um, instead of predicting a continuous variable, we want to only uh, predict a binary variable. So, we, so our, our label, our targets are just binary, zero or one. But, but we use the same machinery, we use the exact same concept, the, the same linear model, we design a loss function and all this stuff. So, so, um, so we have, in particular, we have the same uh, linear model. So theta transpose times x, we, this, is, this is be our model. This would be our, forget about separation helper things for now. This, this, um, this would be our model. And, and we will pass it through, uh, through a function g, the, this output, which will be called something like an activation function. And this function g will, will turn this value into a zero or a one, basically. Because what we want to do is at the end, we want to compute the likelihood that y equals one or, or y equals zero, the, pr the posterior probability that y equals one or zero. So the, the outputs of g have to be between zero and one, so uh, uh, because it's a probability. Um, so, um, so the first question comes, how do, uh, how do we set a proper G? What is a proper G? So um, what, wh what do we set as this function, this activation function? Um, so, so one thing what we want is that we want to have this property. So, so at minus infinity, we want it to be zero. At infinity, we want it to be one. And roughly around zero, we want it to be around half because this, this is basically what um, where will be the threshold basically, uh, roughly at, at which point we kind of switch from predicting a, a one to predicting a zero. And, um, and of course, th th this, this is the threshold and the confidence of our label increases uh, more and more as we move away from this threshold or this boundary. Um, and we also, of course, we also want it to be monotonic and, 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 and also symmetric. So G of minus A would, would have to be equal to one minus G of A. So, um, and here's, for example, like uh, the, um, the exam, uh, an, an example of a logistic sort of like of, of, logistic, of, of a, such a function which is called logistic function. So, so G here, G of theta times X would be equal to one over one plus exponential of minus theta times X. This is sort of the, the formula. And this is a function that was used a lot in, um, in literature. Um, again, because it has all these properties. So, so at, at minus infinity, it tends to zero. At plus infinity, it tends to one. Notice how the range only is between zero and one. So, th so this is the probability. It has to be the probability at the end of the day. So it's not, which is always between zero and one. Um, and again, it's, 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 and it's, also, it's also symmetric around the origin. So th this is, there's an axis of symmetry here around this particular point. Um, yeah, and it's also monotonic. So, uh, so it has all these very nice properties. And this is, again, and this is the formula. So. So if you want to compute uh, p of y equals zero, we simply do the, do the inverse. We take one minus p of y equals one, which is g of theta times, theta transpose times x. Um, do, uh, I have a quick question. Why, why do we need a, a function g like that? Why, why can't we just get rid of it? It's something which has been reduced from between zero and one. Yes, yes. So, so the, the, we have no guarantee that this output is between zero and one, theta times x. So we have to map it to zero one. That's correct. Yes. So um, so again, we have to map it to zero one. That's why we have to pass it through a function g. Um, so how do we compute the likelihood of of such a model? Um, so what we do, uh, we we take the the uh, so this is this is likelihood of, of this is equal to the posterior probability over the labels y, given all our data set x and parameters theta. And the first thing we do when we write uh, the likelihood is we assume independence. We assume the data points are independent, and by assuming independent, we can then factorize this joint probability into a product over all the data points. Of these uh, of these marginals, so now this this will have the product of all the data points y, uh, i from one to m of 
of the posterior probability uh, of y of i so for each data point it's the same posterior but now this is for each data point i in turn um, and then what we do is essentially we do this trick where essentially to spell it out to spell out this probability we we, we well we first break it into two uh, into two parts uh, the case for y equals one and y equals zero and we raise them to the powers of y i and one minus y and and what this does is if, if y equals one this exponent will be one and this one will be zero so th th this will cancel out uh, vice versa if y is equal to zero this exponent uh, th this term will uh, will will become one so so we'll get rid of it so so it's, it's literally just a trick to to actually write it out uh, mathematically uh, and um and again if we actually uh, spell out this probability uh, using the lo logistic function we get that this uh, pro uh, probability of y equals one positive probability given x and theta is g of of our linear model theta x to the power of this uh, my, uh, times one minus g again the same thing this is for y equals zero uh, to the power of one minus y so we get this very nice uh, very nice formula um and and again, we, 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 we apply the same machinery as before. We, we have this function, and then we take a derivative of it, and, and that's how yeah, we find a critical point. Um, um, so, and of course, another trick we do a lot is that we take the logarithm of it, because it's much easier to work with logarithms. Because logarithms, what they do, they, they break up the, the product into sums. And, and so that they have two, this is one key property, another key property of why we take the log of this function is because um, it's monotonic. The function is monotonic, so we will not screw up with, uh, with our optimization methods. It has to be a monotonic transformation. So because of these two very nice properties, uh, we take, uh, people generally take the log likelihood when they optimize these, like, these likelihood functions. Um, so if we take the log of that, we, we simply get the same thing, but now as a sum, and, and we plus this, so everything becomes a sum instead of a product. And we, and we get the logs. And another nice thing we get is that these y's are not in the exponent anymore here. They, they now come in front of the logarithm. Because log of x to the power of y is equal to y times log x. So, so we use that, that particular property of the logarithm. So of course, and how do we solve this? Uh, and we'll, do, uh, we'll solve it with gradient descent. And uh, uh, I, I hope we'll get, yeah, we'll get to some of it today. We'll start again, but we'll continue also next lecture. So uh, with that, um, so, and of course, uh, w once we have something like g of uh, theta times x, we can predict one if, uh, basically, again, we, I was telling you about that threshold. We have a threshold at one, uh, at a half here. So we can basically, to, to predict, we simply say that, oh, we predict one if, g of uh, of this is uh, greater than a half and zero otherwise so that's how we can use for example we can use the, the predictions but um yeah um well actually we'll take a break we'll take a, a short minute break and then we'll continue afterwards and we'll also do a quiz in the second part It's, it's basically, mm. you can remove it, you can set lambda to zero if you want, yeah, yeah. but that could give you a solution that is not very nice, not well behaved. So what you do is you, you regularize it, it's mm -hmm. kind of like, you know, you, you try to enforce a prior onto it, you know, you, you want the solution to be close to the At origin least. here. Okay. So, so the, the L th the, the, this L2 norm, mm -hmm. W transpose on W gives you exactly the L2 norm of W. Mm -hmm. And this forces the, um, what it does, it, you have an uh, origin, of course, and, and a vector. And the norm of the vector is basically the distance from the origin. Right. Uh, so, yeah. so the further away it is from the origin, the more penalized it will be. So, so you'll incur a higher loss. Okay. So basically, 
but that w dot uh, w transpose w is kind of increasing the distance from the origin in order to penalize the, the, the opposite is trying to make it close to the close, origin okay, kind of keep it close yeah yeah okay. but uh, you will have a penalty so again if, if, if you're far away from the origin you have a penalty okay you, you like the, the solutions around the origin basically okay thank you yeah yeah that's what it's saying like like these examples you see here so this so that's the unit circle so so of course origin has the norm zero this circle for example would have norm zero five uh, would be a distance zero five and this will be a distance one for example so this will be this is the unit circle all the points of uh, distance one from the origin so so the more far away you are the more penalty you incur yeah yeah Yeah. And the, uh, the uh, x t uh, times x, it means you get it means you can you can you can get a square or matrix, right? You always get a square with yeah, x transpose x. Yes. But, uh, but yeah. Yeah. Times. But I don't I don't think we can actually uh, guarantee that x t times x can have a that, that's correct. matrix. You're, you're correct. You're, you're right. You're right. Yeah. That's why. Right? Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. So, so we cannot guarantee, right? Like, yeah. 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 Exactly. So so this yeah. still has to be. Um, X transpose X will uh, will be mm -hmm. positive semi-definite, I think. So so basically, but it's still gonna have some eigenvalues that are zero. So it, in it's not guaranteed to be have an inverse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to be positive definite. Uh, yeah, so yeah. all the eigenvalues have to be oh. non-zero yeah, yeah. for it to have an inverse. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, you know, you're right. You're right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's, there's some caveats here. Yeah, yeah. But uh, sometimes so so we cannot guarantee. Mm -hmm. you can yeah. Maybe you cannot use this method, right? Yeah. Um, <coughs> Yes. Yes. Uh, you uh, even if. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So so on, only in that case, Th there is a generalized method. Instead of minus one, you take uh, something called an adjoint. It's like a pseudo inverse. It's a plus instead, yeah. and that one uh, you can do that. Yeah. So basically, the, the story is kind of more complicated. You can do that even for when you have like uh, yeah non invalid matrices. So yeah. So there is a way to do it basically. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 But not with the yeah, minus yeah. one. It's yeah. it's a special operator. Yeah. yeah. Got it. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. 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 So yeah. In regulation term, why do we want like W to come closer to the uh, origin? We want it because otherwise we can get really un uh, so so because of this. You see how? Uh, yeah. L look at uh, at this solution. So for example, this one has a really low uh, low. Uh, lambda so the regularization coefficient so it's not regularized much it's just like even if you, you can set it to zero you get uh, almost the extreme mm -hmm. and then you get you get uh, solutions with really high variance like this you see they kind of fluctuate a lot yeah you can get posterior, yeah a posterior that is like yeah um, okay so basically like uh, if it like weight will explode and it will make it over six uh, is it trying to control that in a way because we are trying to move uh, weights closer to like L to long, we are moving to yeah yeah we're trying to move it closer to the origin. origin. So, so are we trying to keep the weights less <laughs> means lesser values? Yeah yeah, yeah yeah exactly exactly exactly. We want to keep them close to the origin, roughly close to the origin. And the reason why is because we have some prior knowledge about the fact that we about the problem. We know those solutions are preferred. We know somehow that we don't want solutions with really high values, like you know like with the high L two norm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, L2 norm, if I understand correctly, it's a scalar value, right? L2 it's a scalar, yeah. yeah. So when you say W transpose W, it won't be a scalar, right? It will be. Matrix. It will be. It is. It's. It's. it's um. Ah, uh, yeah. Because W is a uh, is a column a vector. Yes. So so it's not a matrix. It's um. It's a it's a it's a, it's a vector. It's a vector of parameters. It's it's our theta. So so W transpose will be a row. Mm -hmm. times by a col uh, multiplied by a column so it's an inner product between two vectors so, yeah. 
Does it make sense? Yeah. In a product, uh, two vectors, you always get a scalar. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. yeah. Hi. So I sometimes I, I don't know uh, why we sometimes write uh, theta is transpose x and sometimes we just write theta. I know. Um, it's it's the same thing. It's like. Um, yeah, th this is basically, it's, it's, it's trying to say this is a dot product between two vectors, uh, but if you don't write them with transpose, these will be column vectors by defini by default. So, so, so this means that th in the uh, product, right? It's the same, it's the same. Uh, th th uh, th uh, this and that will be the same, will give you a scalar at the end. This is the inner product. This oh. is the inner product, yeah. This is the inner product, yeah. Mm, yeah. But, but, it's, but the theta here is bold. I, I guess it's the matrix. No, no, it's a vector. It's always a vector. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so this... Um, so this this data looks like this? No 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 uh, here, sorry. So uh, here we start from here. So 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 theta um oh it has to be something that multiplies with this. So it always has to be like a three a three by one. It's like has to multiply has to have the same. Uh, yeah, it's, it's it's just a vector, a single column vector. Uh, I I will add them. I will add the the theta to y. So it's it's basically the same shape as y. The exact same shape, because it has to, yeah, it has to give a, a, a vector just like y. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's a vector. It's a vector of parameters. It's okay, like so, so, so x and theta are both co columns. So are both vectors. X and. X, uh, so, but x here is a matrix. X is a matrix. It is a matrix. Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yes. You can so do a matrix by a vector. So. So it, it means the inner product here. So it doesn't matter if uh, theta x or x theta y. It is the inner product. No, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't no. matter right? Though they, they will give you a scalar. You always yeah, have yeah, to. So yeah. These are the same. These are the same. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Shall we start? Uh, so l l let's let's start by doing a short quiz, and then we'll come back and we'll see how much we can start from the from gradient descent. Um. I have some chat thing. I'll take the questions in the chat after the Oh, uh, I think you should work with joinmyquiz.com. Uh, let me see. Does that? Yeah, just type uh, joinmyquiz.com. Yeah, that, that would also work. Everyone ready? Yeah, okay. Three, two, one, let's start.
So here, the code is on the bottom. So nine seconds left, eight. Um, so uh, let's see what happens. One, one second. Um, no, I don't want that. Uh, I, I, I'm just showing this uh, for people on Zoom. This is the code on the bottom, if you still want to. So, so let's see what happens. So, so the question was in Bayes' rule, what is the useful way to rewrite the normalization constant p of x? Um, and um, and so, so I, I attached the, that, that figure there with, so again in Bayes' rule, what we have, we're trying to find the posterior in in of, over, over our labels in terms of a likelihood of prior and this normalization constant. Um, so, so um, l l let's hear a bit of the answer. So why, why, so many people have put the first one, but we have a lot of answers with the other one. So let's see what was going on. Um, So uh, yeah, um, so can we write it as p of uh, sum over y of uh, p of x y? Like let's say the second one, this one. We can rewrite it as that as such. We can do that. So this is correct. Uh, this, is, this is correct, but um, it's not completely useful, uh, like in the sense because um, we can break it down further. We can break this join the uh, probability down even further. So, um, so we can. What about this one? So, if what if we marginalize like this? We we sum over. We first sample x, and then we sample y given x, and then sum over y. So the reason why this is not useful is because um, it's because well, how do I change like this? So if we do that, it's because, so this, the reason why this one is not so useful is because we're trying to get the posterior over y already. So like this is what we're trying to compute with base rule. And, and if we uh, write p of x in terms of that, we, it's kind of going back, it's like, you know, kicking our own feet. So like, you know, we, um, we're trying to get to a form of, uh, of the posterior. So, so it doesn't help if we, if we put that again in, in on the right-hand side. Um, so that, that, that's why, so we, you know, this comes again as a posterior of y given x, but this is what we're trying to compute. So that's why it's not helpful. <laughs> um, so, so yes, so, so th and this is, uh, so the one on the left, this is how generally people write it. So, so um, they, 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 they first do this, they write it as a joint, and then they further like uh, write it in a particular form where they, First sample y and then x of y, and x given y, and that's because these are these are the exact same terms. You see that you, you get the likelihood here, x given y, times the prior. We get it in exactly the same way as as the top top right side. So basically, what what this comes is basically the sum of all possible combinations of of y's we can we could have. So that that's why this is this is the useful way to write to rewrite the p of x as. Does it make sense? Yeah, okay. Um, so next question. 
Ready? Three, two, one, go. Why is it showing like this? So for this matrix, which of the following statements are true about its eigen decomposition? Lam uh, Q, lambda, Q minus one. Mark all that apply. So the matrix is two, zero, zero, three. Uh, if you cannot read it. You can use pen and paper again and write stuff if, if it's if it's easy. Yeah. So you don't have to do it just on the phone. You can use pen and paper. Ten seconds left. Let's see. Let's see, let's see, let's see. Um okay. Some more answers coming. Um so, so what is happening here? Uh, well, uh, I'm sorry you cannot see that, uh, that picture, but so this is a matrix 2, 0, 0, 3. It's a very simple matrix. It's just a diagonal matrix, which only has like elements on the diagonal. So, um, so f first, wha what do you think are uh, the eigenvalues of this, of this matrix? From the audience. Two and three, two and three. You see how uh, so so the the first vector here. So the, this is basically scaling the x dimension by two, and and this other vector is scaling the y dimension by three. So the eigenvalues are two and three. So this is this is correct. Um, when we do uh, the eigenvalue decomposition, what uh, what uh, so Q will just have the eigenvectors of A, yeah. Q, Q simply has the eigenvectors of A. So this, so this statement was also true. Um, and wh what are the eigenvectors of A? What is Q? What is matrix Q uh, for this one? Yes, yes, exactly. So they, they are exactly, this is not only orthonormal, but they exist exactly the same basis as before. The only thing we've done is uh, we scale the x-axis by two and the y-axis by three with this matrix, nothing more. We have not changed, we have not done any rotations, any like that, so, so the eigenvectors, um, I, uh, maybe I shouldn't do chalk. Um, literally the eigenvectors are just scaling the, the, uh, the x-axis by, by two and the y-axis by three. This is all it's doing, there's no rotation, nothing else involved, so the eigenvectors are just, are still zero, one and one, zero, it's exactly the same. So. So Q will be, I'm sorry, it's, it's the z one, zero, zero, one. So that, that, that was, you know, um, I have to fix the image. I don't know why it's showing that. Um, and finally, are, are the eigenvectors of A orthogonal? Yeah, they are. They're exactly the basis, the, 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 the original basis. So, um, so Q, uh, one, zero, zero, one, th that's an or orthogonal basis. Yeah, so all of them were were true, all of these were true. Okay, next question. Ready, three, two, one.
we even did another derivation here of this. Time's up. No. No, I don't want this. Okay. So we have quite a few, uh, yeah, um, quite a few answers. Um, so so let, let's, let's start one by one. Does the solution require an iterative procedure? No, it's, it's completely analytic. So, so we don't have to uh, do something like gradient ascent later on, like do any, any iterations over to, to find. We have an analytic solution. We, we multiply these matrices and that's our solution. Uh, so, so it's analytical. Um, the inverse X transpose X minus one might not always exist. Yes, th this is correct. So, so and why, why, yeah, when, when, does it, when can it happen that X transpose X uh, might not have an inverse? Sorry? Singular? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so yes, but, um, and mo it's, it's in many, yeah, it's in many forms. For example, yeah, the, well, it means the one of the eigenvalues is zero. Um, the, the basis of the matrix X transpose times X uh, is made of vectors that are not linear independent. It's not full rank. Any of these are equivalent, basically. It will not have full rank, so that means it will not have an inverse. Um, um, X transpose X will always be what is called a positive semi-definite matrix. It will always have uh, eigenvalues that are zero or above. But not, uh, but but it might still be zero. There might be a few eigenvalues that might still be zero. So we have to make sure none of them are zero to first have an inverse. Um, um, so th does it give a best fit solution in terms of the L1 norm? This pseudo inverse. What? Uh, yes or no? No. Why not? Yeah. It's based on the L2 norm. Um, yes, yes. It's based on the L2 norm because uh, if you remember how we defined least squares, we took the error, the squared errors. We took x theta minus y to the power of two, and we summed over all these squared errors. And that's what. And and uh, this solution was when we would differentiate that function with respect to theta. We'd get this, or also like like this. So so it's. Um, but it's, it's more it's not obvious as much from this as from that because we do, took the squared errors and we took the uh, and i left it as an exercise for you but if you take the jacobian of that the, the derivative set it to zero you will get the solution um can only be computed if the linear system x theta equals y has a solution is that true does do we need to have a like a exact solution So, so the, the thetas we can get can give us a, f a model that does not exactly pass through all the all those data points. So actually, the, the system might not even might not have an exact solution, but you can still compute the the, um, the inverse if it's overdetermined. For example, if you have more data points, many more data points than the number of dimensions, then that it will be in this situation. But we can still compute it. We we, we does not have need to have an exact solution. Um, Um, do we have a final question? Yeah, we do have, okay. Three, two, one. Oh gosh. Um, 
You cannot see the equation. Can you see it on the phones? Okay. I don't know why it does that. Uh, I think it's because of the... Oh. Let me try to... like this yeah I, I, I don't know why it does that um So, um, data points are assumed independent. So, uh, no, actually, no, wait. So, for the logistic regression likelihood function, which of the following are true? So, so this is the likelihood function on the right. I'm sorry, it didn't show that well. Um, so, um, data points are assumed independent. So, is that true? Do we have data points that are independent? Um, we do, we do. We, uh, for, to, for us to be able to, to write a sum like this, to write this sum, we have to assume that data points are independent in our data set. Otherwise, we cannot write this. We cannot marginalize, we cannot write it as a sum. Or even as a product. We first uh, write it as a product and then we take the log, the product turns into a sum. So we cannot do that unless uh, this is true. Why is our real numbers between zero one in the zero one interval? Is that true? No, so, so y is, on, is a binary variable. But y is binary in logistic regression. It's not, it's not a zero one. Um, the label, label y is always binary. So, so the output of g is, is between zero and one. This is the range of g. This one has to be zero and one, but not, the, not y's. Um, um, what about this one? Can we replace the log with any monotonic function? Can we do that? Can we replace the log with any monotonic function? What would break if we if we do that? Yes, yes, yes. You need the log has this property that it breaks a product into a sum. Log of a times b is equal to log of a plus log of b. So to be right, to write it like this. So so if if we had a different function, uh, it would not have this property. So we would not be able to break uh, break the product into a sum. And also the exponents. We're also going to be able to take the exponents down, um, and write it like this. Um, so, so, so th 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 these are all things that 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 are required for us to write it like this. Basically, all assumptions are required. Um, one final question. Um, let's do this. So see the figure above with the solution of a regularized least squares. What are the key differences in the solution? So on the left you have an L2 uh, regularization. On the on the right we have an L1 regularization. Notice how this is the this is the optimal of the function, and this is the regularization. This is yeah the area we're constraining to.
what everyone asked him. Oh. <laughs> so, um, so what, what do we have? Let, let, let's hear some ideas. What what is going on here? What uh, what are, what is the main difference in the solutions? You see how how they do. They first of all, there are different solutions that are retrieved by this function, right? So one 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 is this one. Sorry. Um, Okay, so we have sparsity. Uh, why is this sparse? Why is the one of the solutions sparse? Which one is sparse? This one or this one? The left one is sparse. Uh, on Zoom, we have something? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead on Zoom. Yeah, the second one. The second one. So the right one is sparse. Yes, that's correct. Yes. Um, why is the second one sparse? Uh, also on Zoom, can, can you explain? Uh, uh, for the result, because W two is zero. Uh, no, W one is zero. W one is zero exactly. So W one is zero. W two is uh, is is one here. Oh, yeah, exactly. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, so sparsity is is uh, yes. L two is more accurate. Um, Left Q is equals 0 0.5, right Q equals 1. Yes. The derivative of W is not continuous for the L1 norm. Yes, so uh, this we discussed. Yeah, um, this, this is correct. Although the, the, the key thing I wanted to hear about is sparsity here. So this is one of the main differences in these solutions. That one, one of them for the L1 norm, you see, gives us a more sparse um, full question view. Uh, again, uh, for L1, this is a sparse because only only one of the elements of W are 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 non 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 zero basically. The other one is zero. So you see how it encourages more sparsity. Um, the derivative W is shifted uh, slightly over. Yes, it's shifted. So they're different solutions. The shapes of both constraints. Yes. Um, more points are near L2. The point of intersection is different. Yeah. L2 will be able to capture sparse points better than L1. Um, no, L1 is more sparse than, than L2. Um, yeah. Okay, but I think we get the idea. Yeah, I... Um, okay, so um, th this is great. Let's uh, finish. I wanted to come back. Um... um Congratulations, <laughs> those of you. Okay. Um, so just since we have five more minutes, uh, let, let's start briefly uh, just to introduce a bit the idea of stochastic gradient descent, and we'll continue next lecture and, uh, and, and loss function. So, um, so we'll start another five uh, minutes, and then we'll, we'll, we'll head off. So, so what is... Um, what is a loss function and what is the stochastic gradient descent? So as, as you recall from least squares, we have that the Jacobian, uh, no, the, 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 the loss function over theta is, is a sum over squared errors between uh, labels y and our predictions. And with logistic regression, we got this particular formulation which, which you just saw. Um, so, so another way to, to, to write it is, uh, is also like this, is basically to write, it as, uh, to write this as a, as, a, as a sum over all the data points of a particular loss function over each data point. So this is what we've been doing when we assume that the data points are independent. And this is um, also called empirical risk minimi minimization. Basically, we, again, we, we, um, we minimize this, this uh, empirical risk function. Um, and we can again have ev uh, various kinds of different loss functions. So here, like, when we break the data apart like this. Um, we can have, uh, for example, a zero one loss where it's, it's either, it's, 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 it's basically um, one if, if, if the output is below, uh, bef before zero or negative, and, or if it's zero, if it's positive. You can have a hinge loss, which, which has a particular function, which is a maximum between zero and one minus yA. yA here is the prediction. So, so this is, a is the model prediction, y is the label from the test or training set. So y times a is basically, um, uh, again, we're talking about yeah, um, uh, binary sort of like a variable, so it's either one or zero. Logistic regression is, is this form, exponential uh, function also this one. So there's all kinds of losses we can have. Um, and um, 
Um, and for example, they also look like this. So you see that all of them are kind of like, you know, the decreasing and they have slightly different uh, behaviors. Um, and they can, they're all convex. Also, as functions have some probably they are convex and they can be minimized using algorithms like gradient descent. So, um, so this is where I wanted to get. So what gradient descent does is that we have a function and we're trying to basically start from a particular initial guess and, and, and take steps. Uh, that, that can basically, in the direction uh, uh, where we're trying to minimize the function, take, we take a first uh, one step here and we go get a lower solution and then another step, which gets even lower solution, up until we completely minimize this function. We, we reach the minimum of it. So gradient descent is this idea that we can take small steps along, uh, yeah, along the function uh, 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 with the attempt of trying to minimize it, find the, this optimum. And here, here the optimum, this will be the optimum of, of the parameters. So then we can find the optimal parameters, and and how do we how do we tell the direction of, of where we have to go? It's, it's literally the direction of the negative of the gradient. So um, so that's basically that's um, we will take the gradient uh, at, at each location, and we take and we go in the direction of the negative gradient. So so this is an iterative uh, procedure. So we have to take many many iterations. So this won't be like like our solution with the pseudo inverse, for example, is analytical. You compute it right away. This will be an iterative procedure. It will take many iterations. Um, and again, the, and, and as a refresher, the gradient of a function points to the direction of the greatest rate of increase in the function. And here, the, the function can doesn't have to be a one D function like this. It can be a two D n dimensional anything. It will be a vector that points in the direction of the greatest de descent. So for a two D function. Uh, it will be a vector again uh, pointing in the direction of the greatest increase. Um, so, so this is the key idea of gradient descent, and we use this a lot. It's such a fundamental concept in uh, in machine learning and deep learning. So, how most deep learning nowadays works is it's under it's it's it runs off gradient descent, and in particular, particular versions of it called stochastic gradient descent, and and in particular, like a, uh, and it's also running in batches. So, so we'll go to that quickly. But it, this is such a fundamental idea for current machine learning techniques. Um, so let me see, we have to go, we have two more minutes. So um, so the key idea, I'll just go to this side and then we'll stop here. So we we, we can do, uh, so we can do this, which is classic, uh, the grain assembly. We can also do a stochastic version, which is basically, um, inst instead of taking the entire training data set and, and, and taking the gradient with respect to the entire data set, we can just take each data point one by one. And basically, uh, randomly, we randomly take a, a pair of data points x and y. So it's a single uh, pair of data points, and then we compute the gradient with respect to our parameters theta of the loss function over over just these uh, this pair that we chose here earlier. And then we take the compute the gradient, and then we update our parameters. Um, uh, th so theta i plus one will become theta i minus. Uh, this is a step size that we take. Uh, so, so some kind of like you know weight, the step size times the gradient, this particular gradient of the loss function with respect to our parameters and uh, this uh, two data points, and then we repeat this until convergence, and then we take the, uh, take a different uh, pair of data points and we do this thing again and and repeat until convergence. So, so this way, if we add stochasticity, we can make sure we don't get stuck in local minimas, and then maybe the function has multiple uh, minima and some are be local if we ask to see we can escape uh, these quite easily we, so this is why this uh, this gets super super easy so any questions uh, on on this idea and we'll we'll continue next time no okay then i'll see you on thursday <laughs>
how does uh, assess Google Drive? Yeah, because like in my computer, I'm on Google Drive, I need to log in and then log in and then like all the files in my Google Drive, right? So after I submit on the Grayscope, I can also submit all, all the like screenshots, PDF I attached. Uh, and, um, uh, if you if you wanna take screenshots or something like that, you, uh, put them in the notebook or um, mm -hmm. or in Grayscope. Okay, do you not have an option in Grayscope to take some screenshots? Yeah, I think so. you, you have here. Yeah, so, so put them in there, no? Yeah. But I mean, the idea is to use Google Drive or you don't. Need it. Uh, is it all in the notebook? Or is <laughs> the notebook is not for questions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Something on <laughs> Oh, um, so you can put the answers in the notebook as well, like in later, then we can write all the answers. Like, that, that would be easier, I think. So in that case, you don't even have to, like, take screenshots and stuff. If, it, if, you, if you're struggling with later, you can take screenshots, but yeah, otherwise, I recommend you do it later. And uh, if I, like, I can write an iPad, but I want to try to do And if I upload to my Google Drive and I attach to the collab, it will work. But how does that work for Grace? Because uh, uh, you don't have access to my Google Drive. No, you have to attach them to Grayscope somehow. Okay. Separately. S separately, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. attach them separately. Yeah. Okay. yeah, I won't have access to Google Drive. Yeah, uh, yeah uh, so ask my, uh, um, my TAs because they're going to help me more with the Grayscope because they set it up and stuff. So, yeah, they're actually more familiar than me with the Grayscope. Okay. Come with me, because I have an answer. Yeah. Um, are you using it? Uh, oh, no. Okay.